Welcome to Money and Me. My guest this week is one of the UK's leading financial journalists, and for some years now he's been executive editor of the best-selling financial magazine in the country, Money Week. And he's also just published his first book, The Skeptical Investor. His name is John Stepek. John, welcome to Money and Me. Thanks for having me, Graham. Now, what you may not realise is this 48th floor studio is actually a time machine, and we can use it to just whisk you back to your childhood. And I just want to ask you a little bit about the sort of family circumstances you grew up in and whether things like money were even discussed. I was lucky enough to have a very comfortable background. Um, my mother was a teacher. She stopped doing that whenever we were born and sort of became a kind of housewife. Um, my dad ran a small business, uh, which his father had founded. Um, so it was a family business, uh, basically selling televisions and couches in parts of Glasgow and the surrounding areas. Um, so yeah, I mean, money, we were, we were brought up to be aware that we were lucky, basically. Um, we, you know, we went on nice holidays. Um, money was never something that we had to worry about. Um, and there was always that sense that that was a privilege um, and that it took a lot of hard work uh, and also that we shouldn't take it for granted. Um, not in a heavy-handed way, but I think, I guess the thing is, I think my, my parents both grew up in uh, you know, less well-off families. Because obviously my dad, uh, he was the oldest of 10 kids. And at that time, my granddad was just, I know, I, I can see your face. My granddad was just setting up the business. Um, and so they originally all lived in a, a wee flat in Campus Lang, which is a, a town near Glasgow. And my mum was brought up in a council house. Again, her parents both kind of, you know, worked. Yeah. Um, it's not as if, you know, I'm saying they were, you know, really badly off or anything, but mm -hmm. our circumstances were much better than theirs when they were growing up. And I think that there's always that sense of, how do you stop your kids from being spoiled? How do you stop them from taking things for granted? Um, and I think that's always the case whenever you, know, you, you feel that your kids are getting maybe a more privileged upbringing than you did. Right, okay. So, so at what point did the uh, potential interest of your own in, in things like money, investing and, and journalism develop? I, I always wanted to be a writer, um, pretty much from if I'm absolutely honest, even when I was a wee kid, in fact, one of my earliest memories is scribbling. When I couldn't write, but I was trying to write a story about Scooby-Doo. Wow. <laughs> and I was have about three or four, if I'm honest. And so that, um, that's always been a, a, something I was interested in. As far as the money side of things went, um, as I was growing up, obviously the, the family business was very much a presence in the background because we, we lived on the premises. So the office was directly across from where we lived. Um, and most of my dad's siblings worked in the uh, business as well. So there was always, although my mum and dad always told us we should do what we wanted to do, um, the time I was, all the time I was growing up, I was thinking, oh, I wonder if I should go into the business. Um, there was always that sort of sense of, uh, you know, on the one hand, that would be, oh, be an easy way to get a job. On the other hand, it would also be, there was a certain sense that that's what you should do. Um, even though, as I said, my parents weren't at all, you know, suggesting me go in that direction. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there was the interest in business from that point of view. Uh, but then I went to uni, um, I studied psychology and business studies, slightly odd combination. I found psychology much more interesting. And then for a couple of years, I worked in the TV industry, trying to uh, basically make it as a script writer. Um, but, <laughs> but that didn't happen for various reasons. And then I got married and I realized I need to do something that's a proper job. Um, and I went back and retrained as a journalist because I realized, well, if I want to make a living from writing, that's one way to do it. It's not a very respectable way to do it, but it's a way to do it. <laughs> And then I specialised in finance because I thought that was, it was a topic I was already curious about. Mm. And it also meant I wouldn't have to do anything 
unpleasant, like doorstop people or you know anything like that. I didn't want to be a pure news journalist. That's interesting. You know, you you studied psychology because I think you, you've gone on to write about how uh, so many aspects of the human psyche make us very ill prepared to be effective investors. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I did find psychology fascinating, um, and one of the things when I was a, a young guy. I don't know why I was in such a hurry, but basically I didn't enjoy formal education that much, even though I, was, I, wasn't, I didn't play up in class or anything, I just didn't really like the strictures of school. Um, and I sort of felt I had to go to uni to get a degree, to get a good job, but before I'd gone, I hadn't really known what I wanted to do. And I was, honestly, I was keen to just get it over with. Again, I don't know why, I just wanted to get into the world. Um, so it took me a long time to appreciate uh, that I actually did enjoy psychology and you know I had thought about taking it on but I knew I'd have to do more studying for that and I just didn't want to do that. Um, but I've certainly come back to that a lot in investment because I think for me the, the kind of, well one of the reasons I wrote the book about contrarian investing is that it's, it's all about trying to stop yourself from making stupid mistakes. There's so much of investment is there's, there's things that you know, and then there's mistakes that you just keep making, even though you know this stuff. Um, and I think it's really important to try and help people, if you like, kind of untangle the knots in their head. Mm. Because we're not designed to be good investors. Um, you know, our, our, our minds are not set up for it. Uh, I mean, you can talk about evolutionary biology or put it in any context you want, but really the issue is that investing is both complicated it involves a fair bit of luck, and it's also um, it's not consistent enough in terms of the patterns that repeat. So unlike something like chess, it's very hard to get a good intuition for it. Mm. So often when your gut's telling you to do something, it's actually totally the wrong thing um, when it comes to investing. So you've got to deploy your brain first. But whenever you're dealing with money, you get panicky. Well, that's true, because one of our guests on the programme is an expert in trading the financial markets. And he, he talked to me about the, what he calls the 90-90-90 rule, which is 90% of traders lose 90% of the capital in 90 days, which yeah. is not a great starting point. Yeah, I mean, trading obviously is... I mean, trading is where it, it really is, um, <laughs> where the, the behavioural stuff is at its, its strongest. Um, because, I mean, I've experimented uh, with uh, spread betting uh, because, well, actually, well, actually, I'll tell you why. One of the reasons is because I don't ever like writing about something that I haven't at least tried myself because a lot of the time you find that whenever you, whenever you do something, then the practice is very different to what you might have written in paper. Um, and so I would, I would highly suggest that, that people don't spread bet, but it, just to be clear, okay, so I tried it and um, what I found was fascinating was the kind of, the, the emotional rush that you get from it. It's so immediate um, and also it's very compelling and it's quite addictive. And, but there's also the thing of, it, it, sort of, it doesn't matter that you've promised yourself that you won't do this or you won't do that. You know, something happens in the market and suddenly you're down, you know, five or six hundred pounds and you're suddenly like, oh my, what just happened there? Yeah. And then immediately looking to either chase the loss rather than shut it down and do all the things that you know, you actually know you shouldn't do. You just aren't in control of yourself at that specific moment. So I think it's, it's that, it's, um, it's, it's being able to bypass or short circuit your worst instincts is a really important thing mm -hmm. for an investor. Um, and I actually talk about that quite a lot in, in the book. So uh, will you say, are you closer to the sort of um, Bill Bonner mindset, which is make one investment decision per decade? <laughs> I think that's sensible. If you can get away with that, I think that's a good idea. And I also think for most people, investing really shouldn't be that hard. Um, most people are not keen to actively manage their own investments. Um, you. That's not to say that you can't do a DIY portfolio, but you know, e these days it's very easy to get uh, broad exposure to stocks, bonds, property, a couple of other asset classes, um, and then just invest every month, take it out when you retire. And you know, that's you, that's all you need to do. 
Make sure that it's low cost and you should build a decent enough pot over time. If you do want to be a more active investor, which I think is great as well, um, and obviously that's who Money Week's often writing to, um, it's just worth being aware of all the obstacles that are in your way um, and having a good idea how to kind of overcome them. I think what one of the underlying issues, which I know obviously you certainly try and address through your writing, is, is the lack of financial education in this country. You know, we don't learn this stuff at school or university, do we? We don't. I mean, I'm, I have mixed feelings about financial education in the classroom. Yeah. Um, and the reason for that is that I think that for most people, when they really need the information is almost at the point of sale. Um, you know, if you get taught about mortgages, I mean, I remember getting taught about utility bills, for example, at school. And it was just, you know, another, what, why, you know. Um, you know that it's, it's maybe it'll be useful for the future, but at the end of the day, the electricity company works out your bill, so why do I need to work out how many units have used and things like that. Um, and I can't help but feel that um, it would be yet another subject that for most kids just... You know, that's okay, I've done an exam in that, and then they forget about it until they need it. And then at that point, it's all changed anyway. So, you know, like the mortgage industry, yeah. for example. Yeah. I'm not saying we shouldn't have financial education, but I think we have to think about when we provide it much more kind of clearly. And also, I think we need to make it much more basic. Um, I mean, perhaps talk about principles rather than. For example, pensions. Pensions mm. is an off-putting word. Mm. If you're going to make a list of like, the ten most boring words in the English language, pensions would be number one. True. I mean, honestly, I mean, you don't put it in a headline because nobody will click on it. It's a boring <laughs> word. It's depressing. So you, what I think what we need to get across is that over your lifetime, you have to save money so that when you're not working, you've got money to live off. That's it. That's all you need to know. The trouble is, though, then you get somebody like George Osborne comes along with his so-called pension freedoms, and now we learn two or three years later that over a million people have been caught out. You know, so so it feels to me like there is a time of life where a bit of education might help. Oh no, I, I agree with that. There's, but it's a time of life issue because the other problem is that you're right. George Osborne came along and changed that, and some of those changes were were good. But the problem is that before him, you know. Gordon Brown came along and changed it, and before him, Tony Blair changed it, and Gordon Brown changed it again. So, you know, we now have an entirely different pension system to the one we had 20 years ago, and we also had a different pension system then to the one we had 20 years before that. So, I mean, most people didn't have to worry about it, you know. Uh, for, I mean, for example, I walk around my kind of hometown in Kent, and I remember uh, we just moved there 10 years ago, and I kept uh, bumping into kind of Older men, but not, you know, massively, maybe in their 50s or early 60s, mm. clearly retired, you know, just doing odd jobs or, you know, putting about in the garden. Mm. And I was sort of wondering, I wonder how all these guys have made enough money to retire. And it turned, the vast majority of them were, were XPT workers. Right. So they had, you know, nice occupational been, pension. Right, nice occupational yeah, pensions. Yeah. And you're kind of looking at them and you're thinking, you know, good on you. But on the other hand, I will never ever save enough in my pension pot to have as good a pension as you've got right now. And if you save the maximum by law, I, you, well, exactly. you, you couldn't get more yeah. than 25k a year on an yeah. annuity. So, I, so <laughs> it is, it's, it's the, I think the other problem is this thing that is ever changing. Mm. Um, you know, you, I can see why people get put off because every single budget, you know, someone else has got their hands in the till or they're messing about. And, you know, you imagine if, for example, um, and this is not to be actually party political about it, but if we go from the current government to a Labour government who are more radically left-wing, you can imagine that the pension system might change drastically again. So it's not just about education. It's about the fact that the people on the top keep change, sweeping, pulling the rug out from under us. Um, and I think we could do we. Well, less of that, and I don't know how you do that. OK, well, well, we'll perhaps talk a bit more about that after the break. But for now, John, thank you very much. Join us again in just a few moments. <music> Welcome back to Money and Me. Before the break, we learned John's views about financial education and pensions. Now I want to turn to that small topic, the 2008 financial crisis. So, John, 
um, there's that famous quote from the Queen visiting the LSE saying, you know, why did nobody see this coming? Um, I think you would take issue with that narrative. Yes. Um, I mean, I feel certainly our own magazine did mention a, a few times uh, during the, the run-up to the financial crisis that there was, there was going to be problems with credit. Um, and to be fair, we were by no means the only ones. Uh, I mean, one reason that I was paying attention to it was that, for example, Gillian Tett and the FT was writing a lot of columns about the problems in the US subprime market. Um, and actually, the, the people had been looking for ways to short US houses for a long time. Um, again, the guys in the big short are the ones who get the, the kudos to an extent, but again, they weren't the only ones. Um, so it was clear that we were coming up to some sort of you know, crunch. And I remember in uh, mid-2007, we had a cover in the magazine saying, here comes the credit crunch. Mm. And we always had a cartoon on the front page, and it was a, an investor in the jaws of a crocodile, basically. Um, and that was before you know, Northern Rock went bust. Um, and also before the Icelandic banks went and bust. So I don't think it was as difficult to see coming as the uh, prevailing narrative has it. I mean, the economists didn't tell the Queen that, obviously. I wish we'd sent Her Majesty a copy. Yeah, yeah you should have done, shouldn't you? But I suppose really the $64,000 question is, you know, have we learned the lessons from that crisis? And you know, are we in danger of something similar or even worse happening again today? See, I think this is an interesting question. Um, I feel that uh, history doesn't tend to repeat itself when it comes to booms and busts and that each crisis is different from the one that came before it. Mm. Uh, that doesn't mean I don't think we're going to face another crisis at some point. But I think that people are currently primed to, for 2008 to happen again. I tend to think the next crisis will be an inflationary one and I'll, I'll explain why I think that. Um, so after 2008, central banks printed a load of money, drove up asset prices. That essentially fixed banking balance sheets, not so much in the Eurozone, but certainly in the UK and the US. Um, but they've left us kind of slightly mired in this situation where so much, I guess, capital has been misallocated that uh, we have companies that shouldn't still exist and couldn't survive at higher interest rates. Um, we have low productivity, which is, I reckon, although it's debated, but a direct result of low interest rates, um, which favour higher employees over investing in you know, kind of efficiency-making machinery. Um, and we're also left with the situation of, well, how are we going to get out of this? And also as a result of 2008 and the actions that were taken then, that's why we're going through the political turmoil we're seeing just now. And the main knock-on effect of that if we don't get it under control and get people happy with the way things are going again is that there'll be more and more pressure on governments to directly print money and give it to people mm. and this is why we're seeing it in america with the rise of uh, alexandria ocasio cortez and talk of a theory called mmt which i, I won't go into except to say it is just printing money and giving it to people rather than giving it to banks now, you might say, what's wrong with that? I mean, the banks got bailed out. Why shouldn't the This is Ben Bernanke's helicopter money, basically. Yeah, helicopter yeah. money, that's yeah. it. Um, it's, it's certainly been talked about a lot more. When it happens, if it doesn't work at first, they'll just keep doing it until it does work. At that point, you do get inflation, probably quite high inflation. Um, but I'm not sure we're even going to need to get to that point. Um, because at the moment, you know, Wage inflation has taken a long time to take off, but it's gradually picking up both here and in the US and even in Japan. Now we've got pretty much full employment in most of the world's biggest economies. At some point that has to turn into inflation. Mm. And I think the issue then is that most people in the market are still terrified of deflation. I think, in a way, you know, you'd think one of the biggest drivers of inflation would be some sort of normalisation of interest rates, but the Fed seems to have thrown in the towel already. <laughs> Aye, well, I mean, that's because the Fed's also terrified of the idea of normalising rates. But I actually think that normalising rates would be the healthiest thing they could do just now. And I do think if they actually want to get healthy inflation going, that's probably what they need to do. Um, I mean, I've been thinking about ways to think of this as a metaphor, but... I think it's almost like sharpening a knife on a whetstone. You know, 
essentially we've got a blunt whetstone and we kind of keep on going like that and think, mm. how come this knife's not getting any sharper? Mm. And it's because the problem is with, you know, the central bank policy. Yeah. They're going in the wrong direction. They're kind of suppressing activity by keeping rates this low. Um, but this would be more driven by, you know, if it, if it had a negative impact on the stock market or if the president sends a particular kind of tweet, we're going to change our strategy again overnight, you know. So, yeah. so uh, how do we get out of this? I mean, well, it is difficult, especially whenever they are as focused as they are on the level of the S&P. I mean, to be fair to Powell, I don't think that he's necessarily that bothered by what Trump tweets or doesn't tweet. Um, it's just it's always going to be easier for central bankers to cut rates than raise them because cutting rates is popular and raising rates, most of their colleagues in the economics profession can't see, well, why would you raise interest rates? There's no inflation, you know, all the rest of it um, because they've, you know, got this kind of very academic view of how things work. You know, they don't want to get kind of slighted at dinner parties by their, their colleagues or, or, you know, the worst thing of all is if they um, send the economy back into a recession, and then everyone says to them, oh wait, you said you wouldn't do that back yeah. in the 1930s, yeah. and you've made the exact same mistake again. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah, I think the bias is always going to be towards much lower rates. Okay, so let, let's turn to your, your, your new book. The, 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 there's a little bit of a clue in the title, The Skeptical Investor, <laughs> but tell me, what, what's the kind of underlying message of the book? It's basically, it's about contrarian investing, which I've uh, slightly cheekily rebranded as skeptical investing. Um, and I, I've done that for a couple of reasons. Um, it's not just to try and make a catchy title for the book. Um, contrarian investing, everybody talks about it. And there are lots of associations and cliches attached to it that I think aren't really that helpful. Um, so the basic idea is that contrarian investing is going against the market. But the problem with that is the market's often right. So always going against the market is going to be a losing strategy. So you have to you know, adopt some guidelines as to when you go against the market. Um, and so uh, the other reason is because, for example, value investing is a strategy, quite concrete. You know what it is. You buy cheap stocks, wait till they go up. Uh, momentum investing is a strategy. You know, buy stuff that's going up and hope that it keeps going up, which works. Um, but contrarian investing isn't specific like that. It's more of a mindset, and that's why I've you know, rebranded it as kind of sceptical investing. So is, is there any difference between sceptical and contrarian? Well, I suppose it's just the way that I've framed it. So what I'm talking about is how you should think about the market. So the only thing that doesn't change in the market is the fact that it's humans that are in it. Mm. And it's our behavioural flaws that are the only things that, that are the things that drive the cycles that we see. Yeah. I think if people take one thing away from the book in terms of um, the psychology of human beings, it's that we have this tendency to pattern spot. Mm. Um, and that's just ingrained in us. It's, it's how we stay alive, basically, and how we navigate the world. Um, you know, we have to work out, oh, well, if that happens and that happens, then that's going to happen, therefore I should or should not do it. Mm. Um, the problem is that that doesn't work well in investment because it leads to a tendency to extrapolate so you see in straight lines, whereas markets and economies obviously move in cycles. So you tend to find that people are most euphoric when they should actually be most concerned. Now, when the sky is blue, everyone wants to invest. Uh, whenever it's chucking it down, nobody wants to invest. You should be the opposite to that. And that's what I think, um, in terms of human psychology affecting the markets, is the most important thing to remember. Um, because the other thing is it's really... I find it fascinating um, how quickly narratives change in markets, but then become the accepted wisdom. So the story changes, and then all of a sudden everyone thinks, oh, that, that's the way it always was. It's, True. Uh, I mean, I mean, one of the things I'm seeing at the moment is, you know, masses and masses of money being piled into tracker funds and, and these kind of things, which you've already said, you know, are, are definitely a, an investment strategy. But it makes me think, is this now the perfect time to go against the crowd and become a contrarian? Yeah, I mean, I think there are opportunities that arise from the influx into passive. Um, all I would say is I think that the, the way that it's presented is a bit misleading. Uh, we have this sort of dichotomy between passive and active management. 
So the idea is if you, if you don't want to go passive, you should go active. But that's not the case. I mean, I think tracker funds are great. I think if you get the choice between investing in an S&P 500 tracker, for example, or a large cap American stock market fund run by an active manager, you should definitely go for the passive option because yeah. it's cheap and this guy is not going to beat the market. So you might as well get the market return if you believe that the US stock market is worth investing in. So really, these are just tools to um, express your view on markets. If you like Japan, will I buy an investment trust or an OIC or a tracker fund? Well, look at them and see which one suits you best. That's fine. Where I would say the issue is, is this. Because of the kind of mania for tracker funds and indexing just now, mm. what we're finding is a, a huge number of indices being created so that they can have funds that track them. And what I can see definitely happening is that, particularly amongst the slightly more fancy tracker funds, like maybe low vol funds or, or ones that are based on various uh, factor strategies, I can see that people might buy them thinking they're going to deliver one thing. Mm. But in fact, you know, they haven't looked into small print or you know, they haven't kind of figured out exactly what they're, they're really betting on. Um, and I think that's probably where you've got the potential for this all to go wrong and for capital to be misallocated. Okay. So I think in summary, what we're saying is um, these kind of passive funds have their place, but also don't forget there's some huge opportunities if you're willing to go against the crowd and become a bit of a contrarian or at least a sceptical investor. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, well, a good point, good example is this. At the moment, the UK is among one of the cheapest markets in the world. Um, it's sort of kind of, you know, down to about the top 12 or something like that. Um, you know, and it's next to Portugal. So if you're looking for a good investment, then the UK is a contrarian investment. It doesn't matter if you buy a tracker or an active fund, that's still a contrarian way to invest your money. Brilliant. Well, that's some great advice to end on, John Stepick. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. See you again next time for another Financial Life Story.